Hello and welcome to the Michigan State University Museum's uh, Cultural Collections Center, Resource Center, located on the campus of Michigan State University. And we are in an area that is uh, essentially closed off to general public use, but we are a, a place where uh, students and faculty and staff and visiting scholars to make appointments to come in and use our collections for research and for teaching. We're actually in a space in a museum that is in the middle of a very substantial textile uh, collection uh, that we have here at Michigan State. And in particular, we're in the part of the textile collection area that is devoted to quilts. Um, we have had a very active research agenda for uh, several decades now, uh, focusing on quilt studies. And what examining this form of textile can tell us about the human experience. So um, I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, you know, I, well, first of all, I'm going to uh, let my co-partner here introduce themselves, and then I'll tell you a little more about myself. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Berkeley Sorrells, and I'm a senior at Michigan State. I am in the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities out of Snyder Phillips in a double major in the History Department. And I have been working with Marsha since December of 2020 on this quilt that you see here in front of you. And I am uh, Dr. Marsha McDowell. I am a professor in the Department of Art, Art, History, and Design. And I'm curator of folk art and quilt studies at the MSU Museum. We're two other hats. Uh, one is I direct the Quilts Index as part of the Matrix, the Digital Humanities Center uh, on campus. And I also am a, uh, directing the Michigan Traditional Arts Program, which is headquartered in the Residential College of Arts and Humanities. And it was through a um, undergrad research grant that we were able to, I was able to uh, get Berkeley to be able to work with me on a particular project. But again, I just wanted to say a couple of things. We, you can see both of us have gloves on. That's because we are in the collections area and we are uh, trying to use the protocols of working with collections. And by wearing gloves, we don't transfer any dirt or grease or anything um, when we are touching the textiles, which we will be doing today. We will be folding them and examining them more closely. But I also want to point out is that in this particular area of our research collections are these rolling uh, opening doors um, and drawers that can be pulled out. And maybe I'll hold out this one here. Is how we store our quilt collections. Every quilt is um, rolled on an acid-free tube. It is then um, interleaved with acid-free tissue. A film called Dartec, which is a, a breathable film, is rolled on top of it. And then it's tied with muslin strings like this. And then they nest inside little notches in the drawer. And this efficiently allows us to store many quilts in a safe manner. And also anybody who wants to make an appointment to see the collections, to see the quilts, sometimes all they wanna see is just a little bit of it. So they can come up close, the quilts are protected, but they're visible and uh, that makes it easy. We've got uh, probably 10 cases here filled with up to, um, I'm, I'm not sure how many exactly uh, in each case, maybe talk about, I should know the number five, <laughs> five, five or six per drawer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 drawers. So you can see that each one of these cases is pretty effectively, efficiently, and professionally taking care of our university collections. Um, this space right here is uh, accommodates the 
visitor groups, student groups, visiting scholar groups, uh, up to about 15 people. And um, we would love to have more spaces, uh, but at the moment, this is what we have and we try and make full use of it. So these quilts have already been taken out. The ones that we have on the table are, are ones that we've already taken out of the drawers. And it usually takes two people to unroll what you've just seen and lay them out. And we've got five quilts to show you today, but we will, we're gonna start with this one. But first of all, we are going to show uh, a, uh, well, Berkeley, you should do the intro. Yeah, you're know, gonna see. Absolutely. So um, part of the research that I completed with Marsha was um, submitting an, a, a video for the undergraduate um, research and arts fair um, that took place back in April. It was all a, vir a virtual symposium this year. Normally um, before the pandemic, it was all the MSU union for the weekend. And um, I was, I'm very grateful and excited to announce that my, I won first place on my, on my project and video as well. And so I'm very, thank you very much. It's <laughs> been amazing. Um, and so I basically had to take six months of research on this quilt and somehow put it into a 10 minute video. So uh, it proved rewarding and difficult and very, very exciting. And so we will be playing the video that I created um, right now before we dig into the quilt. Acquired by the MSU Museum in 2018, each square holds the individual stitched name and often the address and phone number where they resided. What this creates is a collective historical document that holds the stories and shared experiences of these women and their communities. I have spent the past five months hoping to piece bits of their narratives together, ultimately only skimming the surface of the collective history this quilt holds. I sought the answer to questions surrounding this quilt's origins and the role of quilt making within these women's community. This quilt documents a groupness and a shared experience that I wanted to explore and document. Each square foretells an individual story of a greater narrative that has been stitched together. A majority of the addresses on the quilt reside in what was the Black Bottom neighborhood, which was a vibrant hub within Detroit's African American community, seen here through these two pictures on the 2000 block of St. Aubin from the digitized photographs within the Burton Historical Collection of the Detroit Public Library. The four women on the quilt that also resided on St. Aubin Street per their address squares were on the 3000 block, but these pictures contribute greatly to the contextualization of the quilt and the women who made it. We can see busy street corners with shops and families and friends getting together. This is the neighborhood that these women called home. But this is how a majority of the neighborhood looks now. This is a photograph of the Google Street View of St. Aubin today. Barren, overgrown strips of land with the remnants of sidewalks and driveways, drawing us to see just where entire neighborhoods used to flourish. What can we learn about the Black Bottom neighborhood and the families who called it home when the physical structures of the neighborhood often cease to exist today? This is what leads us back to the red work quilt. We need to investigate all of the pieces in order to create a cohesive cloth and begin to document a larger narrative. So this is what I set out to do. My initial research materialized in physically plotting the addresses onto a map to contribute to a more visual understanding of the quilt. Using a Google Maps feature called My Maps, I was able to plot the points for each address on the quilt, corresponding with the name of the woman who presumably lived there. On the left is a map of Detroit from 1920, and the yellow circle there denotes the area of Detroit where a majority of the houses are located. This was east of Midtown here and south of Hamtramck. On the right, a close-up of the squares of Sister Adele Anderson and Sister Carrie Turner, respectively, where you can see the arrows pointing to the zoomed-in MyMaps plot where the address was located. Most of these addresses, as I have previously mentioned, traced back to Black Bottom and surrounding areas, which were prominent hubs within Detroit's African-American community that were raised as part of urban renewal efforts in the second half of the 20th century. Sister Carrie Turner's Square also contained another address, 2135 Mac Avenue, which was home to the Zion Congregational Church of God in Christ, known as Mac Ave Church. This was one of the first clues in the early stages of my research that allowed me to begin to discover common threads between these women. I found myself on a search for smaller details and individual narratives to allow me to focus on the larger group. 
This was one of the first discoveries that led me down that path. So I turned to Ancestry.com and the plethora of census data available up to 1940 to see what I could find. This is the census page for Sister Phyllis Sheffield, documented on the quilt as living at 2145 St. Joseph Street. It is difficult to zoom in and see, however, her occupation is listed as seamstress and industry as sewing project. This was a major confirmation early on that, yes, of course, this was the right person, but also that she had been working as a seamstress and thus likely quilting for a great portion of her life and was very skilled at it. For the most part, my work in census records did not prove as lucrative as I would have hoped. I was able to confirm about three addresses and names on the quilt, but a vast majority of the women never appeared in the data I was digging through, no matter how I adjusted the search criteria. One of my first reasonings is that the 1940 census data is the most recent data available to the public. Due to privacy concerns, census data only gets released 72 years after its collection, so we could not even access the 1950 census data until 2022. Perhaps this time next year, I will be, have been able to find more of the women and their families on the quilt as documented in the census. However, it is still confusing that so many of these women and government documents and data were so difficult to find. Which leads us to the Michigan Chronicle, Detroit's primary newspaper focusing on the city's African-American community starting in 1936. Much to the gratitude of digitization efforts, a majority of the newspaper can be accessed electronically through the MSU library. This database proved to be the most precious source of information, not only on the, in, on the individual women themselves, but that of the greater role of textiles in Detroit's African-American community. The two articles from the Michigan Chronicle on the left and center show the success of the Willing Workers Quilt Club, including names and photographs of the members and their quilts outwardly celebrated and promoted to the public in the newspaper. On the right, two photographs from the Burton Historical Collection that depict a group of girls in nursing caps in 1942 displaying a wartime quilt. In seeking to contextualize the role of quilt making, the celebration of quilts and quilting is apparent in the Michigan Chronicle and other digitized photographs. What this does is reinforce quilting as a group activity, equally, equally about the camaraderie and social aspects of the process as much as the end result itself. If anything, the end result provides a visual and tangible representation of the vibrancy of the women that made them. So I dug as deep as I could into the Michigan Chronicle database. I searched each individual name, address, and phone number one by one to see what details would emerge and if these women were ever mentioned and I wasn't disappointed. On the right, we see an article from November of 1967 that celebrates the Building Fund Program for the Zion Congregational Church of God in Christ at 2135 Mac Avenue, where multiple women on the quilt are celebrated. Three more women who contributed to the quilt are mentioned. Eantha Pinckney, whose address is not stitched by her signature, is the corresponding secretary. Sister Ethel Wiggins of 9134 Delmarish Church Mother and Sister Iverlene Parker of 2122 Pierce is assistant church mother. On the bottom right, we see a photograph of three women, one of whom is Mrs. Iantha Pinckney on the far right. There are many fantastic elements to this article. Firstly, it celebrates the congregation as the oldest church of God in Christ in Detroit, and its founder, Elder I.W. Winans, member of the Gospel Powerhouse Winans family, called the First Family of Gospel by the Washington Post in 1996. An article highlighting his 86th birthday celebration in 1961 on the left here speaks to his respect within the Church of God in Christ community in Detroit. This establishes the church as a massive pillar within the community and those who lived around it, which is a majority of the women who contributed to the Red Work Quilt. Secondly, the article celebrates the women who contributed greatly to the Building Fund program, and as previously mentioned, this includes three more women on the quilt. Mrs. Evelyn Winans, of relation to the beloved elder I.W. Winans, is pictured next to Mrs. Iantha Pinckney on that same bottom right photo. This article reinforces the true respect and power these women had within their church and thus within their greater community. Even more so when we see once again on the article on the left that church mother Ethel Wiggins paid tribute to Elder Winans at, at the same 86th birthday party and Mrs. Iverlina Parker presided over the dinner table. But I have truly only skimmed the surface in my five months of research, much less in this presentation. There is still so much that we do not know. There are many women on the quilt, such as sisters Ida Johnson and sister Justine Daniels, Mrs. Irene Green, among many others, whom I have yet to find any information on, whether census data or other newspaper archives. I also have yet to truly find why this quilt was made, who for, and when. 
Did these women continue to work and quilt together? Do living relatives of the women today have stories and photographs to contribute to the lively history of this quilt and the community that made it? There is still so much to discover. This photograph, taken in 2013 by Chilean photographer Camilo J. Vergara, was taken on the corner of St. Aubin and St. Joseph Street, which would have been only houses away from the home of Sister Phyllis Sheffield, the seamstress and quilt contributor living at 2145 St. Joseph. This house remains. The Redwork quilt remains. Both provide important and telling glimpses into the lives of those who lived in Black Bottom. While the homes and individuals are not standing, they are preserved in the lives of those who lived to see them. And in amplifying the voices of the 20 women and their families, we will fill in previously blank pages in collective history. And thank you very much for listening. Well, today's presentation um, was, uh, we had this idea to do this today because we wanted to link to the exhibition that is currently or just opened at the Michigan State University Museum. It was called Track and Traced. And um, what we want to look at today here is how you can use collections to uh, track and trace history, but also some of the, the tools that we use in investigating, in tra tracking and tracing the histories of these objects. We usually call this object-based inquiry. You have to start from one object. And this object right here is one that we acquired about five years ago from a dealer, a, a quilt sales dealer who was based in Oklahoma. And I had seen an image of this quilt online, I think in a Facebook page or someplace. And I went, oh, wait a minute. Um, that quilt says Detroit on it. Furthermore, it's got these phone numbers that I remember as a child. Um, these ones that are not um, just all numerical, but they're alpha and, numer and numerical. And so I thought, well, this is something we need to get for the Michigan State University Museum collection, because we actually have a focus here. We're very strategic in what we collect here. We tend to like quilts that have mysteries to them um, so that we can use them as um, objects for further research. Uh, we also like uh, quilts <laughs> that are also well documented and, and come with dates on them or the signatures of the person who made it. And maybe there's a family story that goes with it or um, the donor has um, stories to tell about the quilt. Most of our quilts are acquired through donation. A few are acquired by purchase. And those that are acquired, and it doesn't matter either whether we accept something from uh, a donor, uh, an object, or we purposefully buy a quilt. It's intentional. So there are, we're offered many quilts, which we say we don't want, but we do want quilts in some of our strategic areas of collecting focus. One of those uh, focus areas is Michigan quilts. One of those areas is African-American quilts. And I can say that we have probably one of the top two or three collections of African-American quilts in the world. Uh, we also have a focus on quilts related to human rights. Uh, uh, and we have a focus on uh, African or um, Native American quilts and also on quilts and health. Quilts that are connected in some way with health and well-being. So all of the quilts that are on the table today are Michigan. And this one, as you already have seen in the presentation, uh, Berkeley's presentation is African American. So when we got this quilt, we didn't know all of that backstory that um, Berkeley has already teased out. But I think at the, this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to Berkeley and she can start maybe elaborating a little bit more on the sources that she was investigating 
and about some of the particular blocks in so Berkeley. Yeah, it, it, it's actually, I can't lie, it's pretty, it's a wonderful feeling to see this quilt. I have not seen this quilt in person. Last time I saw this, I knew virtually nothing except for what was on the quilt. It was last December. And so when I walked into this room and I saw it on the table, I, I was just beaming under my mask. It just, it makes me so happy to see this quilt again. And um, it was, I'm very, it, it was a really interesting experience being able to start with one, essentially a, a document, a, a piece of history. And it was, it was a start, starting point and an ending point. And it was somewhere where if I ever got confused or frustrated with, with a lack of information, this quilt stayed here. It was, it was like a return point. It was a way where if I ever felt overwhelmed, I could just go back to what does the physical document have? Like what can, what is right in front of me, which I, which I, used very frequently. Um, a few things that I will point out. I mentioned a few a uh, few of the points, a little bit of this in the video. However, I'll just show it again. So um, right here is Sister Carrie Turner's square. Um, and as I mentioned in the video, this was where I noticed the 2135 Mac Avenue address in her square. And that is the Zion Congregational Church of God in Christ, the Mac Ave Church in Detroit. Um, and that was where I found that original address. And that was really, that was like the floodgates moment for this quilt for me. That was one of the first um, clues, real clues that I had that, that opened, opened the floodgates uh, on, on, on this research. Um, a couple more things that I'll point out just because it is interesting to see is that we actually have a, a family on this quilt. We have um, Doris Parker here um, and her sister, is down on that side of the quilt, it's uh, Genevieve Parker as well. Both of these women are actually still alive as well, which is pretty amazing. And their mother here is um, Sister Iverlina Parker. Um, and they all had the same address on their quilts, on this quilt square. And so I, I figured with the same last name, they were most likely related, but um, I wasn't sure um, how they were related until I was actually able to interview um, Doris Parker's um, daughter, uh, Miss Jeanette um, Wallington. So it was very wonderful to talk with her. She also told um, Miss Jeanette Wallington, so Doris Parker's daughter told lovely stories about Sister Destine Jan Daniel, whose quilt square is right here, and said that she was just the most um, very, uh, she, she said she remembered her sense of humor really well, that she laughed and had this big laugh and was always making everyone around her laugh and feel welcome. So I loved hearing these, those stories because it really took this document and reinforce how incredibly human it is in all aspects of how it was made and who it, who it, who it depicts and um, represents. Uh, yeah, and I think what we're trying to do is, is um, I mean, these are human made objects mm -hmm. and it's those stories that animate history for mm -hmm. us. They animate the object by having the oral histories in this research, but otherwise um, it, it, it's a mystery. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Visually, it's interesting. I will say that this is a common pattern in which to put signatures. Also note that in terms of research tools, uh, uh, Berkeley in her presentation, she mentioned uh, going online for the, the, like the um, digitized issues of the Michigan Chronicle. Yes, but in, but at the end of her presentation, she, we still had not made human contact yes. with any one of the, uh, the people's names that yes. are on here. Yes. But then I, you know, we're trying to be creative in our paths we take for uh, research. And I, I thought, oh, I wonder if that church has a, uh, a, much of a presence on the web uh, and and it turns out they don't have a very robust um, uh, website uh, but they do have there was a church of god in christ history page and so i posted a photograph of this as well as the names that were listed on the quilt which we've got already written out mm -hmm. And within about, I don't know, 70 hours, I think we had about 45 contacts and um, which 
has now moved us into the second phase of research, which is oral actually history. talking to the people who made the yeah. quilts or who are direct relatives of the quilt. We still don't know why the quilt was made or exactly when, mm -hmm. or how did it get from Detroit Oklahoma. to Oklahoma? Mm -hmm. We do have a clue on the invoice uh, from the dealer. It said, found in a state sale on Long Island, so, uh, New York. So we are already trying to investigate from people who are uh, African-American, um, lived in some of the black communities on Long Island, is there a relationship between one of these names and somebody who lives on Long Island? And just standing here earlier, we're, we're realizing there are some other clues that, that you know, that should be investigated. Absolutely. We, we just stood here and saw that um, most all of the uh, white thread, it, which is the quilting stitching, which holds three layers of the quilt together, the, the top in um, a batting um, of usually cotton, and then the backing. So those three layers make it a nice warm quilt. Mm -hmm. um, but we realized that, wow, well, in this square here, the, the lines are at, at angles. They're very um, uh, similar in terms of the parallel line length or width. But then here's, here's another one where they're, they're narrower and curving. Mm -hmm. And another one, that uses what some people call elbow quilting because they, it's a quilter who sort of just pivots with her elbow and and runs her stitches that way. But then we were realizing, which you really can't see when you're using just a digital yeah. image, is that this is these are white threads, but why is there right there a blue thread there? Why is there yeah. a blue thread right here holding those three layers together? And then another question we came up with, why is this name in blue thread? Why does it have no address? Why does it have no phone number? So we've been surmising, well, maybe the quilt was made for that person. And, but it, we're still investigating. Absolutely. And um, I think, you know, for us, again, as, already was being summarized by Berkeley in her presentation. This really is tangible evidence of what, <laughs> of a thriving community in Detroit. And um, yeah, it, there's, we have no idea if there's anything like this that these women also did, like or other groups in that area. But we have this, it is a document, it's a text to be read. Mm -hmm. and, there are many clues to investigate still. Even more. <laughs> I think with that, we're going to turn to the next quilt. I don't know, how much time do we, are we? Uh, we're at 11.30. Okay, perfect. And then, were there any questions that um, have come in regarding this before we turn? Yeah, so feel free to put any questions in the chat for us. And I believe there's also a Q&A function as well. So we can pull this up off there. Whoa. <laughs> Here, I will turn yeah. some, come down this way. What's that? Yeah. Okay. There we go. It's a little easier. All right. Okay, so um, this quilt recently came to us as a donation. Um, it was uh, came through a member of a family uh, who had inherited it, um, and she she knew, as we could also see on the quilt, that it was from a town called Cambridge, Michigan. And it was dated 1892. And Berkeley, can you read the 
yes. um, inscription? So the inscription says, the Ladies Aid Society of St. Michael's and All Angels Church from Cambridge, Michigan, 1892. But this is 130 years old. 130? Yeah. 29. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what really caught our eye about this quilt is this block right here, which has the portraits of the wives of the two presidential candidates for the 1892 U.S. elections. Mm -hmm. And why would the wives portraits be included on a quilt mm -hmm. now we today this quilt is um you're able to see it virtually on a viewing table within the msu museum galleries mm -hmm. and we're in berkeley will be back over there we'll be in the basement <laughs> the lowest level of the building i'll be running there right after this <laughs> and she will be on hand to interact with visitors to see what kinds of questions they might come up with to get the research started on this quilt. Obviously, we know that it, we know where it was made, we know when it was made, but did all these people make them, this quilt? Probably not. Um, it's so gorgeously yeah. ornate. Yeah. Every and individual square is so and gorgeous. It, and again, because uh, we have, um, in the museum collection, we have a number of quilts that are what is called red work. And the, that comes mm -hmm. from the color of the thread, red, that was fashionable to be used in, in a nice, uh, it was became a color fast thread used on a, a dark red on a white or pale background, made for an easy way to render signatures, render um, uh, images of all kinds of things. And it was very popular for a number of years. Mm -hmm. It still has a following. People still do red work today. But we had the good fortune of uh, a woman named Deborah Harding, who's based in New York, who did extensive research on red work. And she donated all of her quilt uh, red work uh, research papers to us, along with a number of examples. So um, we like especially acquiring quilts with red work, embroidered stitching uh, that, that have signatures uh, from Michigan, because again, it is a document and it allows us to understand Michigan history better, as well as perhaps religious history, political history, Etc. Yeah. So we really haven't. This is the start of this research. Berkeley is going to be um, working on researching this quilt uh, over the next few months and find out as much as she can yeah. about it. Absolutely. Can you speak, you know, what are some of the things that we um, are starting with? Other questions like, gosh. I guess one of the one of the aspects of this quilt that is very fascinating to me is, you know, how were um, women involving themselves in politics prior to suffrage, the right to vote? So that's one aspect. My my history major brain, that's where it goes, of course. And so that is that. I mean, when it comes to analyzing it, once we're able to find a lot more information about this community, the members of this Ladies Aid Society and the Cambridge Michigan community in general, I think that that will be a really fascinating step to take and looking at election results from this community in this town at that time and all of those sorts of aspects that'll really help us inform um, the, the, the situation in which this was, this was made. So. And, you know, it, and if you were to look at this from like an art perspective or yeah. a graphic design perspective, yeah. and you go like, wow, this, this, this rendering of circles is so different than this rendering mm -hmm. and and as um people who have really studied red work have have uh discovered um documented well is that uh patterns were sold for people to use on this kind of quilt so it's typical that maybe um 
flowers or insects or mm -hmm. uh, children's imagery might have come from a commercially printed pattern. But what's the source for those two women? You know, was it a newspaper account? What was it? What an was official it? portrait? Yeah. And when it's just completely graphic like this, or, uh, you know, here's one with leaves. Uh, and here's one with these interesting um, curved areas. And yeah, some of them are thematic. And mm -hmm. some here's stitches that are rendered this way. So we do know uh, from uh, studies of signature quilts or um, that oftentimes they could be used for fundraising. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, somebody might pay for the privilege of putting their name on this textile mm -hmm. and then the collected funds would go towards something. Maybe it was to build a steeple on a church, or maybe it's fundraising for um, uh, a war effort or for a political campaign. We just don't don't know at this moment about this one, if it was even a fundraising quilt. Mm -hmm. The one that we just saw was more likely a friendship quilt, just a statement of friendship. M might have been a presentation quilt, maybe to that person whose name is rendered in the blue thread. These are just mysteries we're looking at right now. Oh yeah. But I think um, I, I belong to the American Quilt Study Society. In fact, I was once their president. They met here once um, on campus. They hold an annual seminar and publish an annual uh, publication on, on uh, quilt studies. And I just got my recent copy and it has an article called The Threads of Redwork, Outline Embroidered Textiles. Well, the woman who wrote this actually borrowed a number of quilts. During the pandemic, we had to send the quilts to a location in Ohio, another historical society, because we could not have people in the collections here at all. But by that, way she could do very close examination that the kind of examination you can't do just by digital mm -hmm. and Absolutely. in her study she was looking um at the thread the red thread itself and she what was uh, uh, investigating that because she thought that if she could tell uh the differences between the kinds of red threads that are in textiles, she could trace it to when those threads were made uh, publicly available um, for sale. And so she's, she was looking this closely. She was with um, magnification, she was able to tell if the thread, the embroidery thread was two ply, two little bit strands together or three ply whether it was twisted and all of those become clues to when the likely date of the textile is. So it's an incredible level of yeah, detail. It's a very, uh, I'm sure her study is gonna be used by a lot of people to help date quilts and that you know, it might even help us now on the, the uh, one we just looked at. Yeah. Um, because all we really have for that one is a range mm -hmm. of dates, a range of potential. I also might note too that, is that oftentimes on these signature quilts or album quilts or fundraising quilts, any quilt that has a name embroidered on it, there might be people who have actually signed their names themselves and it is their true autograph. And But there are other names that were probably rendered by somebody who had better handwriting than they did. And so this is this uh, uh, square right here is just such a case. It looks like all names are done in one hand in one kind of script. Very ornate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, okay. Are we? Yeah. Can we go to the next one. And, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um,
Great to show on this. I don't one. know where the picture went. <laughs> yeah, wait, hold on. Get it straight in. Yeah. Now, um, before we zero in on this quilt, this next quilt, I do want to say something. It's it's a tough subject. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it it deals with what I might call the dark side of quilting, because this technique of fundraising, of course, could be used for positive causes, but it was popular as a, as a fundraising tool. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that sometimes this technique was also used for causes that were um, maybe not so socially accepted. Mm -hmm. And that's the case in the next book. No. Um, I don't know where that picture went yeah. for this one. Yeah, don't move. Oh, maybe. Don't drag it on it. Yeah. Cut, cut, cut it up. Yeah. This quilt here was brought to my attention by a man who uh, from the west side of the state who was a high school history teacher. He had taken the quilt to a local antiques dealer who, because he wanted to know more about it um, and he wanted to have a sense of its value. And that person, that antiques dealer said, oh, Michigan State University has a, a number of quilt researchers and please call um, me. And so that's how I found out about this quilt made in Chicora, Michigan, 1926. And as you, as you can see in a close up here, it's a KKK quilt. And it has a, even a hooded embroidered figure riding on a horse also hooded and it has kkk 77 which means that it was affiliated with the clavern of the ku klux klan based in chikora 1926 and again like those other two quilts we've just looked at are the names um, rendered in red work embroidery and some of them are um, actual signatures and some of them are just simply one person writing one one hand writing script okay why would a university uh, have this well for me uh, it is also a document it, it's a document of history it's a document of a history that we don't want to hide. And we can use this as a, a means of education. And so we have used this as a teaching tool to say, well, people will say, well, you know, what, there wasn't any clan activity in Michigan. And we say, uh-huh, yes, look at this. Well, what we found out from the donor he eventually donated this to the museum, uh, Carl Rowe. He said that he didn't even know that this was in his family, but his great aunt, his aunt um, had, uh, his great aunt, I think, was downsizing. And because he himself was interested in history, she wanted to give him two items and she presented them in a, a grocery bag uh, crimped at the top. He opened it. First item was a family Bible. Great, you know, it has all kinds of names of the family members and would be great in knowing genealogy. The second item was this one, and he was shocked. In fact, his children didn't even want to have this in the house, but he was interested in it because it was a history item. So he found out from her that she, had, in fact, had been a young girl and had been one of the ones to embroider names on this. And furthermore, 
it was, I think her father, his grandfather had um, been at the clan uh, gathering and it, this was auctioned off at, at that gathering and his grandfather won the auction, hence it was in their, their family. Well, <clears throat> so we acquired this uh, by virtue of his gift. And then I and Mary Worrell, a colleague here at the MSU Museum and um, undergraduate, um, I'm sorry, a master's student, uh, Charlotte Quinney, took on investigating this. And sort of much like the techniques that, that Berkeley was using, we, we got a plot maps and aligned every one of these names um, and colored it onto a plot map of that county and said, all right, this, this person had a farmhouse here, because this is a very rural area, like and in Southwest Michigan. And so we looked up uh, through census listings and tried to find out ethnicities. And, um, and then this is before we had so much available on the internet, we actually got in the car and drove to archives, uh, state archives, the Bentley historical collections, um, Western uh, archives, and even went to the library that was the closest to this and looked in vertical files. Would you believe we could not find any shred of evidence of clan activity in this area, but this is a smoking gun. So there's, this is a definitive statement that yes, indeed, clan was active there. So, um, so for us, it's 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 a document that we need to uh, we needed to investigate, and um, you know it does tell us now that you know don't don't presuppose um, you might not be able to find documents where you typically think you're going to find them. You may have to look at other forms of of um, data such as this to be able to construct these histories of time and places. I will point out that it is creepy because when you look at this, there is, uh, it's, it's worn. You can see the, the fabric fraying there. You can see standing along the edges. Um, and, and those edges are usually where you pull a quilt up and, and you've got the grease, like remember I said, um, can damage clock. You know, if you pull up this quilt at night and you've got your neck here and perhaps a beard, you're, you're um, destroying the fabric along the, the edges. So, uh, as Berkeley saw as we first unfolded it earlier, you know, she had a visceral <laughs> uh, reaction and it is creepy. It's even creepier when you think that people were actually sleeping under such wrapped up uh, at night. night. Yeah. Okay, so let's. Yeah, oftentimes people think that uh, quilts are made for warm and fuzzy kinds of purposes, but um, not always. Oh. Up a little. Yeah, All right. Yep. That's good. <laughs> Big stretch time. Yeah, I think yeah. you can get that. So, oh, yeah. I could get it and put it just on that stack. Yeah, that's clumsy, but <laughs> yeah, that, the, the lining is quite um, heavy. Mm -hmm. The batting. All right, so we, we have that quilt. Um, I know from my own research on quilts, there are very few quilts pertaining to the KKK um, in the country. Um, 
And it could be that that's not the kind of quilt that people want to make known or put in public museums. But um, I'm thrilled that we have it here to document not only Michigan history, but um, that kind of, of hate group. Um, and so, lo and behold, just a few years ago, because we acquired that one now quite a few years ago, we got a call from <clears throat> somebody in Detroit, Michigan, who had heard that we had that one quilt. And she says, actually, I have a family quilt also. And I thought, oh my gosh. So we now have, I think, the country's only two known signed KKK quilts. Um, uh, but there may be others out there. We just don't know about them yet. And th this one uh, was dated 1927. Um, and uh, can you read that in, in the middle section, that block? This block here? Yeah, that one. I it think it says it's uh, Genesee, Gen oh, Genesee, Genesee clan, clan number, number four, four, November 17th, 17th of 1927. Very close to the date of the one in uh, from Chicora, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And the same date is written on this square as well. Yeah. So you see some. And, and one of our purposes of having this section session today is we wanted to let you know that um, we really um, want to reach out to faculty and students who would like to do research. This one, there's no research yet on this one. And it's a prime document to be investigated. You know, what was the relationship of, of all of these individuals to the plan? And are they related? What is their ethnicity? There is, is one block, uh, Berkeley, those two away from me, that one that says it's from, uh, it says Imperial. Yeah, uh, yeah. from Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. So like, why is an Arkansas name on that? And yet we know it's from Michigan, Tennessee. So we would love uh, somebody to take this research on. And the last quilt that we're going to show, and uh, that uh, quilt from De was also um, donated to us. This one we acquired. And we acquired it because, first of all, we had a uh, already a clipping from the Detroit News, uh, 1934 from 1935, which was a story about this quilt, the making of this quilt. And it was made by um, Stuart Ansel, man, a man. It's very uh, atypical for men to be quilters. So it was a man from Detroit, and he was a police officer. And he was a fan of the Detroit Tigers. And he took it upon himself. Uh, well, first of all, he, he was uh, quilting from like the age of nine. So says the article in the paper. Um, but he and the article described how he had gone and gotten all the signatures of the members of the Detroit team, Tiger team, that that year won the American League championship. And apparently he also got the signature of the groundskeeper and the trainer. And then he superimposed those on baseball forms, put the diamond in the middle, and then uh, incorporated the Detroit Tigers images and the classic D for Detroit Tigers. Fantastic tiger, yeah. that's just yeah. great. And this also is something we have not done any research on. And it, you know, for anybody who's interested in 
sports history in general, tiger history in general. Um, as uh, my husband, who also is a curator and a um, sports uh, lover, uh, he, he pointed out that this is a team that had Hank Greenberg on. So he was one of the first Jewish baseball players. Um, so anyway, this is a, 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 <laughs> a quote we would love to have uh, more investigation on. So do we have any questions yeah. from anybody? I will come over here and read some of the questions that we received and thank you. All right, so a first question we have is from Sarah. And Sarah asks, was the red work quilt with the first lady portraits quilted? I found a similar quilt in a thrift store, which isn't quilted, but the individual blocks are pieced with finished seams on the front and back. Is this common? Yeah, and in fact, um, I, 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 when I was born, I, my mom was given a quilt for me and it carried my birth date year. And um, the same person who did that study of the red thread, I sent her my own personal family quilt so that she would have yet another example to look at. And I always thought that the quilt was made in 1950, the year I was born. And she said, well, but she says, I think it was probably the squares were made earlier separately and then they were assembled on your birth year because the red thread that was used in the quilt actually predated 1950 by about 20 or 25 years. So yes, it, because of those um, commercially distributed patterns for doing embroidery on squares. Uh, it, you could make piles of squares and then figure out how you wanted to um, place them in a quilt design. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that was any other questions question that was that it. And yeah, I think we have a couple minutes. So if there are any last questions in the comments or in the Q&A function or so, so I'm going to turn in to um, Berkeley and just ask her, had she ever thought of looking at objects as a means for her own path of you know, interest, you know, history studies? Absolutely. Yeah. Had you ever thought <laughs> that this was a realm of, of um, source material? I honestly didn't. I didn't. And it's funny because when I mentioned to some of some people I know, oh, well, I research quilts. They're like, you research quilts? What can that tell you about anything? That sounds like a bunch of boring stuff. When in reality, they are some of the most tangible, human, shared, gifted, by through generations materials that um, provide so much. And I'm learning um, I've, I've looked at every single quilt that I've, that I've, that I've seen in my family's house or anything completely differently now. Um, and it just, it just goes to show you how m much, I love the human story. I love how every, how quintessentially human this is. And I think that that's a very um, important part of why quilts are so, such important as documents. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I can say that um, in these drawers behind us, every one of these quilts, is the result of the handmade um, efforts yeah. of an individual, sometimes just one person, but sometimes like the quilts that we have seen today, they can be by the hands of many people who were involved in one way or the other in producing an object that then collectively uh, tells us something about that group, that time period and um, uh, you know what was important to them in their lives. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. I can come read this one last question really quickly. We have, um, this is from Alan 
Um, what is the most common way that such quilts are received, either by research institutions, museums, etc.? I know you have mentioned antique dealers, even thrift stores, etc. So how how do we find the yes? Quilts? How are how do we receive our quilts? Oh, um, most most of the quilts that come to us as donations come as uh, first as we're not going out and finding them the donation ones are because somebody has emailed us and said we have a quilt we think it belongs in a museum we'd like it to be preserved um and and we have them a committee that we go well is this fit does this quilt fit our strategic collection development plan uh you know if this was a quilt, for instance, about the Chicago team, we would probably say, wow, fabulous backstory. And it's really interesting. It was made by a man, a police officer. But um, we would probably say we would like to recommend that you go to and we try and help place quilts um, at, in our sister organizations. Um, if we are proactively doing research um because this is more of a reactive research uh we've got a number of quilts that were accumulated when we were doing actual field research and in fact the, in the case behind me we have a number of quilts that were made by native americans and um, i worked with the smithsonian national museum of the american indian on um uh a survey and field research of American Indian, um, Native Hawaiian, and Alaskan Native quilts. And there was a so in these instances, the quilt we were able to acquire, we paid for because we were on a reservation, and the quilt was then and there. And if we were going to be recording an interview, photographing the maker. We also wanted to bring back home the quilt. So we had a special allocation of funds from uh, the university president's office to um, underwrite that kind of acquisition. But it was very intentional. And mm -hmm. um, I can <laughs> say sort of like the African-American quilt collection, we actually have the best um, collection of indigenous quilts in the world. All right. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening to our enthusiasm about <laughs> working with objects, um, the treasures that we have here in the collections at Michigan State University that are held by the museum. And in particular, this amazing uh, set of quilts that we are so dedicated to seeing used in research and teaching. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you.